it's Glenn Scrivener from Speak Life. We're doing Reading Between the Lines, and today's phrase is East of Eden. Uh, humanity is homesick. Uh, we feel restless, we feel estranged, we feel out of place. Um, but that's very odd, isn't it? Where else should we be? Where else have we ever known? Why should we not feel right at home here in the world where we live? We don't know any other world. Um, C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory spoke of this inconsolable longing that human beings have. He says, it's the scent of a flower we have not found. It's the echo of a tune we have not heard. It's news from a country we have never yet visited. We seem to have this homesickness. Homesickness for what? Homesickness for Eden. Genesis 3 from verse 21, though, tells us that we have been exiled from our true home. Genesis 3 verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way back to the tree of life. We began on high. Uh, Eden is actually a mountain paradise. Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us about that. It's the garden of God, but it's also the mountain of God. But soon we were down and out. We were east of Eden. The fall was very literal. Um, and therefore, ever since then, east of Eden has been our home away from home. And we all know that things are not right. Um, can you imagine, though, the next generations, can you imagine the before and after that Adam and Eve have to cope with now? They have known the joys of paradise, and now they have to adjust to life in a fallen world. That must have been the most uh, horrific wrench for them. And it's interesting to think that for the next eight generations, Adam and Eve themselves were able to pass on to future generations what it was like in Eden. And that they must have they must have had such a sense of, of nostalgia. And really ever since that, maybe maybe it's kind of passed on in our bones, this sense of primeval nostalgia for Eden. So what do we do? What do we do with this inconsolable longing for Eden? What do we do with the fact that we are now east of Eden? Do we despair? Do we become melancholy? You know, so much, so much art and literature and music is shot through with this, with this melancholy sense of being east of Eden. Do we, do we just despair? Or do we try and build paradise here and now? Is that what we do? Well, neither of those are the Christian option. The big question we should be asking is not how do we respond to being east of Eden. How does Jesus respond to, to us being east of Eden? How does the Lord respond to us being east of Eden? Does he say, you know, well, good riddance to you all, and he double locks the doors, and he says, and don't come back. Is that, you know, you might expect the Lord to do that. Um, does, does he do that, or, or does he yell sort of advice to us about how we can get our act together and come to our senses and, 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 uh, and come back to him? Is, is that really what he does? No, the, the main thing he does after exiling us is join us in our exile. That's how he responds to us being east of Eden. Uh, there was a time when I ran a, a youth group uh, a few years ago, and there were a bunch of troublemakers who uh, did some, some horrible things that really needed some kind of discipline. And uh, we had a law, and the law was you do that and you get banned for the next week. And so we, uh, we had to enforce this discipline, because for the sake of the others and for the sake of the smooth running of the youth group, these guys couldn't go on the way they were going on. And so with heavy hearts, we said, I'm sorry guys, you're banned next week. And of course there was kicking and screaming and they didn't like that at all. But it was interesting that the next week, the next Friday night, was a very subdued evening and, and uh, nobody was particularly happy about it. But it was at the very end of that evening that I realized the thing I should have done. As we were locking up the youth group and as we left the church halls that evening, we saw the youths that had been banned from the night before, from, from the week before. Um, they had nowhere else to go. They were just kicking around in the neighborhood and so they were sitting on the wall next to the church halls in the cold and in the dark, and instantly I knew what I should have done. You know what I should have done? Yes, I should have exiled them. Yes, I should have shut the doors on them and banned them. But you know, the next week I should have joined them in their exile. I should have joined them in the cold and in the dark and keep them company. 
because that's kind of what the Lord does. The Lord, when we break his rules, yes, he shuts the door on us and, and, and pushes us out into the cold and the dark, but he never pushes us out anywhere that he does not join himself. He joins us out in the cold, out in the dark. And that's what he's doing in the Gospels, is he's coming into our exiled situation. He's traveling east of Eden to be with us and to march us back home. How do we respond to our sense of inconsolable longing? How do, we, how do we respond to being in this valley of the shadow of death, of being out in the cold? How do we respond to being east of Eden? Do we despair? Do we build heaven here and now? The Lord responds by joining us in it. And he says to us, look, you're in a mess. You have that inconsolable longing and you're not going to get it back yourselves. But, but everything you have lost and more, that is found in me. Jesus says to us, don't look for Eden. Look for me in the middle of your exile. If you're feeling the cold and the dark very keenly right now, perhaps you could make the Apostle Paul's prayer from Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, your own prayer. In the middle of the cold and the dark, you say, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm.